there was nothing I could do. He just fell right off in the hot coals, and I saw the poor thing squeak and writhe. I thought, oh, just like you. I'm thinking, oh, the poor little mouse is suffering. Now, your heart, didn't you hurt to hear? Doesn't that bother you to think a little mouse burning? Do you think God would burn His children forever and ever? You wouldn't do it to your dog. You wouldn't do it to a mouse. And yet there are churches full of people who think that God is going to take bad children that die lost once they reach the age of accountability and they die. And He's going to put them in blistering sulfur and brimstone. And they're going to burn there forever and ever and ever. Think about how terrible that is. It's not what the Bible teaches. Thank God. Amen? God is not going to have a universe where people are going to be tortured through eternity for the sins of one lifetime. That is what you call a doctrine of devils. What does the Bible say? The wicked will perish into smoke. They'll do what? They will consume away. All right, I need a brave volunteer. Um, I'm going to go around. I sometimes neglect the edges here. And so last time I had two girls and a boy. And so I was, so no, don't raise your hands if you've had your hands up before. You, you are, you got a friend who's advocating for you. So you, come on. Okay. But no, you're advocating for you to know what? No, I just needed one. Sorry, guys. Sit down. Just, just one. Sorry. But don't worry. No, we're not done yet. All right. Um, let's see here. Are you strong enough to do that if you use both hands? You don't know? I appreciate your honesty. But let's put your jacket down here because we don't want that to go up in flames. Try to use both hands. See if you can. Just click the, the handle here clicks in. Let me show you how it works. Squeeze real hard. Now you just, with your hands, like a grip here. here. Give me a hand. Give me both hands. Here you go. Now, can you do that? All right. You can let go now. See if you can do it on your own now. You can. I knew you could. All right, come on back here. What's your name? Elliot. Elliot. All right. Are sinners going to be immortalized? What do you think? What did, what did we just read? The wicked shall perish in the smoke. They will vanish away. All right, let's see. Don't you, you, just, you let me bring the paper to you, okay? <laughs> Go ahead. Let's see if you can get it going. All right. How is this going to happen? Are they going to burn forever? There's no ashes. My hair all still there? Okay. Thank you very much. He did a good job, huh? Brave man. How much was left? Nothing was left. The Bible says, notice this in Malachi chapter 4 verse 1, the day comes that will burn as an oven and all that do wickedly will be stubble. You know, in California, we have rice fields, and they burn the rice. After they harvest the rice, they burn the stubble so that it just burns it down. They can plow it up, and it's all gone is what the Bible is saying. The Bible says the day will come that will burn as an oven. Now, how is God going to destroy the wicked? This is actually a picture. I've been there years ago. I was 16 years old, so that's a long time ago. I went to the ancient city of Pompeii. The volcano, Mount Vesuvius, blew up, and it was a wicked Roman, it was like Las Vegas back then, it was a Roman party city. We can tell from the excavations, they lived a pretty wild life, and it was like fire fell down upon them. They had hot ash, and people were all sort of frozen in position all through, and they haven't even excavated it all yet. But whenever I think of Sodom and Gomorrah, I think of this. It says in Malachi chapter 4, you will tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet. Now, here's the question. Are Sodom and Gomorrah still burning today? No. They're set forth as an example of what is going to happen to the wicked. They were consumed. The cities were never rebuilt. The people died, and they are dead and gone. It says in Revelation chapter 20, verse 14, this is the second death. What was the first lie that on earth... And how do we know it was a lie? What did the devil tell Eve? The serpent said unto the woman, Eat from the forbidden tree. You will not surely, what? 
die. He said, you're not going to die. What did God say would happen if they ate the forbidden fruit? He said, you'll die. The devil said, you won't die. See, what the devil says is you'll live forever in heaven or you'll live forever in hell, but you're immortal. But are people immortal? The Bible says God and God only has immortality. What does the Bible say about sinners? The soul who sins, what will happen? You got two choices. You remember John 3, 16? For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him might not perish, means die, but have. You got two choices. Moses said, I set before you this day life and good and blessing, death and evil and cursing. You've got two choices, life and death. It's not life in heaven and life in hell. So the wicked don't burn forever. They perish. The Bible tells us only God has immortality. When will the dead live again? The Bible tells us, you read in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then it says, we who are alive, you know, most people through history have died. There's going to be a generation of people alive when Jesus comes that will never have to die. Like Enoch, who's the other one that didn't die? Elijah. There, the Bible says Enoch was the seventh from Adam. There'll be people who I think are living on the verge of the seventh millennium who will not die. They will be translated. I hope some of you young people are in that category. We don't need to be afraid of dying because we'll get glorified bodies. But the, those of us who are alive and remain will be changed. In a moment you'll get your glorified body. God will put you, who you are in there. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. That means a body that never gets old or die or sick. And this mortal will put on immortality. Bible promises, he that has the Son has life. He that does not have the Son does not have life. If you've got Jesus, you may die, but as it says in 1 Corinthians, you don't need to be afraid. Are you glad that God has promised to resurrect from the dead those who love Him when Jesus comes? Do Christians die? Christians never really die. They go to sleep. And when Jesus comes, they wake up. Amen? Amen. The Bible says that when you accept Christ, you get uh, eternal life. When do you get eternal life? When Jesus comes back or right now? The gift of eternal life is being offered to you right now. And the devil can't take it away. If you surrender your life to Jesus, you continue following him. He will be with you. You don't have to be afraid of death. You don't have to be afraid of hell. You just walk with Jesus day by day and he will finish the work he started in your life. Don't you want that life? Hi friends, you know the most important decision a young person can make is that decision to follow Jesus and begin that amazing adventure to eternity. That's why we're so excited to tell you about the new amazing adventure programs that are available. During these nearly 10 hours of exciting high definition programs, the young people will do science experiments, learn about history, nature, encounter some wild animals, and most of all, they'll learn about Jesus from the Word of God. What's really neat is there's a beautifully illustrated Bible study guide to go along with each of the video presentations. These beautiful illustrated study guides are full of pictures and puzzles and Bible stories. They'll lead your kids through an incredible journey with Jesus while they learn about Bible doctrines like heaven, hell, and how to be ready for Jesus coming. And for me, the most exciting thing is this new Amazing Adventure series goes along with the Amazing Facts Adventure Bible. And this is a Bible, I'll tell you. It's full of studies, illustrations, puzzles, special tools that make studying the Bible fun and interesting. This new Amazing Adventure series is the best ever. The Bible, the study guides, the DVDs are all designed to lead your young person on a journey for life with Jesus. 
To find out more how you can get yours, call the number on your screen or contact us at afbookstore.com. Would you like to start your day with an inspiring spiritual boost? You can get a daily devotional from your friends at Amazing Facts each day right to your inbox. These five-minute nuggets of faith provide an amazing fact that's tied to a deeper spiritual insight and it's designed to kickstart your day or to help you wind down before bedtime. Sign up by visiting amazingfacts.org, click on the Bible Study tab, and choose Daily Devotions. Do you have a loved one behind bars who needs to learn how to find freedom in Christ? You can sign them up for free Amazing Facts Bible Study Correspondence Lessons. Students who complete the course will receive a certificate, graduation gift, and have access to other free courses. To enroll your loved one, send their name, inmate number if available, and the name of the facility to which they're assigned to AF Bible School at AmazingFacts.org or call 1-844-215-7000. In 2008, a survey was done, and they discovered in North America that 40% of the people who were married got divorced. In 2009, though, the statistics went down. The divorce rate was reduced, but they also found out fewer people were getting married. The experts realized that people who had been involved in one failed marriage were frightened to get involved in another marriage, and so more and more people were just living together because they were afraid to trust and to love again. You know, that same dynamic is playing out in people's church experience. Sometimes people are hurt in church and they leave and they're afraid to give love another chance and come back. But friends, I believe the Lord is calling you. This is the time to renew your faith. Nobody was there to defend me. Nobody was there to protect me. My question was, why did that happen to me, God? Why didn't you intervene? Once I hit my teenage years, everything just started coming out. I felt embarrassed of what had happened because for so long I felt it was my fault. There were times that I prayed, but it was prayers of resentment and anger and just yelling at God. I was so confused, so depressed and I could not bear any more of the pain. You know, what's the point of living? It might as well just die. I started cutting myself, but I heard a small, still voice, and it said, stop. Give me a second chance. And right there, I just felt something completely different. I felt a presence there, and I put everything down and I went to my room and I just started crying. I realized that me and God connected so well, and I no longer saw him as just a God that no longer cared, but I actually saw him as a father, and I continued praying. One day, I was sleeping, my mom came to the bed. She said, Connie, he's here, he's in town, and the Lord impressed me that you need to face a situation, it's time for you to forgive. When something so drastic and so painful has happened, forgiveness is very hard because you're vulnerable. You let go of that ego, that pride that has taken over you for so many years. I prayed and when we confronted the situation, it was the most amazing moment where we could pray, we could cry and we could forgive. And because of that, I'm able to help others and tell others that there is hope and there's someone that does care. My name is Connie Gomez and I reclaimed my faith. You know, many of these testimonies that you're hearing are people who actually went to the um, AFCO program. They're 
people from all around the country and the world who came to Amazing Facts and they trained in how to share their faith with others. And we were surprised what a large percentage of people that were all of a sudden filled with a burning desire to share their faith with others, they had drifted away. When they came back, they realized the key to life is receiving Christ and sharing Christ. And the whole perspective changed. Well, we'd like to welcome you once again to Reclaim Your Faith, friends. And I want to thank you for those who have come here in the Maryland area and those who may be watching all over the world and all over North America. And we're very thankful that you've tuned in. We're talking about some of the different reasons that people become discouraged and stop going to church and what the solution to those things are. So what's the right view that we should have regarding some of the issues that, that discourage people and get them to jump ship, so to speak. One of the principal things when we interview people is dealing with what we call friendly fire. Somebody in the church did something to hurt them, or some group, or some clique in the church hurt them. Sometimes we're even upset with God. So they pulled back because they've been hurt. You know, I understand that during the Gulf War in 1991, that first invasion, by the way, our son Daniel was there then in Iraq, that of the 131, I'm sorry, no, 148 uh, young men and women that were killed during that time in that war, 31. Happy Sabbath! So we praise the Lord for giving us this another day to rest after, after our academic works. So the Lord deserves our praises. Now before we start, shall we bow our heads for a word of prayer? Father God, the Lord of the Sabbath, we thank you for this day of rest. And as we worship you tonight, we invite your poly presence in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we start our praises, shall we sing higher ground? Oh, 
we have in Jesus. song we will sing pass me not O gentle Savior let us all rise
invite everyone to kneel as we pray. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this Sabbath day with praises of joy. We thank you for guiding us throughout the week as we faced new challenges. We thank you for the Sabbath day that your day of rest has finally come. Lord, may you bless each one of us, especially the participants, the speaker, Brother RJ, the Prosa, as he deliver your message. Lord, may the things that you want us to hear um, will be, be instilled in our hearts and in our minds. In this, all we ask, in the loving name of Jesus our Lord, amen. To our brothers and sister who is present in our Holy Church and to those joining us online, in behalf of the Philippine International Church, I warmly welcome you all. Good evening and happy Sabbath. I would like to request everyone to please shake the hands of the person in front of you to the side and to those seated behind you and give them a cordial happy Sabbath. It really brings great joy to witness God's children coming together to praise and worship His holy name. We offer our praises to the Lord for granting us the strength to overcome the challenges of the past week. To set our minds for the Sabbath, let us meditate on these words from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 20, verses 19 to 20. It says, I am the Lord your God, Follow my decrees and be, careful, and be careful to keep my laws. Keep my Sabbath holy, that they may be a sign between us. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. May the word of God bring us blessing to all as we join in the spirit with God's chosen servant, Brother R.J. the Prosa. May the message resonate us in our hearts, fostering love, compassion, and unity among us. As we partake in this moment of worship, may the grace of God embrace us once again. Good evening and happy Sabbath. God. 
garden The day I left home I knew I broke in his heart And I wondered then If things could ever be the same And that one night I remembered his love for me And down the dusty road ahead I could see It was the only time It was the only time I ever saw him run And then he ran to me Held my head to his chest Said my son's come home again Lifted my face Wiped the tears from my eyes With forgiveness in his voice He said, son, do you know I still love you? He caught me by surprise And he brought me to my knees When God rest so I run to me I was so ashamed All alone and so far But now I know that he's been waiting for this day. I saw him run to me. He took me in his arms, held my head to his chest. Said my son's come home again, lifted my face, wiped the tears from my eyes. With forgiveness in his voice, I felt the love from him again. He ran to me. Send my sons come home again Lift in my face Wipe the tears from my eyes With forgiveness in his voice He said, son He called me son He said, son Do you know I still love you? He ran to There is so much love in that song. Amen? The Lord run, not running away from us, but the Lord running towards us. It tells me that God is not passively waiting for me when I come to Him. He is the one looking for me. Grace is in search of us. Amen? Good evening, everyone, and happy Sabbath. Are you happy this Sabbath? Indeed, we are happy that for the past week, the Lord has been with us. The Sabbath is not about the day. The Sabbath is about the person. Amen? This is about Jesus. It's not about rules and regulation. It's about love. This is a day of love. It's about a day of relationship. With Jesus, And I just praise the Lord that I have been given an opportunity this evening to share with you the words of God. And so I'd like to start, and the message we have tonight is entitled, From Nobody to Somebody. 
Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, you have promised, Lord, that as we will seek you with all our hearts, we will find you. And we ask, Lord, that you will fulfill your promise to us this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. In the society that we are living today, in this world, in this sinful world, people try to get their value from, from what they can do. People get their value from what they have, from what they possess, from their possessions and from the, their position. There's a lot of people today that are slave of position. Do you agree with me? There's a lot of people today who are slave of possessions, of achievements, of flattery. But as Christians, we are blessed because we know that our value, my value, does not depend on what I have and what I don't have. My value does not depend on what I can or cannot do. My value depends on the heart of God. Amen? In our story today, there is a woman who was not only healed by Jesus, but was restored by Jesus. So I invite you to open your Bibles with me in the book of Luke chapter 8, verse 43 to 48. It says in verse 43, Now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years. Now that's a very limited introduction. There's a lot of information missing here. There's not so much details about this woman. We don't even know her name. We were just told that this woman was having an issue of blood for 12 years. She had this terrible issue of blood bleeding for 12 years and the, the bible is telling us it looks like the the problem of the woman is not just physical because the verse is telling us that she had spent all her livelihood just to be healed in her longing in her desire to be healed she had spent not only part of her livelihood, but she has spent all her money because she just want to be healed. She just want to be healed. She had spent all her money. She went bankrupt. She became poor because she just want to be healed. And you know, one of the sad reality of life is this. When you have a lot of money... You have a lot of friends. If you don't have a lot of money, you don't have a lot of friends. And if you begin to lose money, you begin to lose friends. Is that true? That's, the Bible, that's a very biblical idea. We have in, in, in the book of Proverbs, we are told, the poor are shunned by all their relatives. How much more do their friends avoid them? In another verse in Proverbs, uh, still in Proverbs, the poor man is hated even by his own neighbor. In Tagalog, ang taong mahirap kahit kapit bahay niya galit sa kanya. That's in the Bible. If you don't have money, you don't have a lot of friends. So this woman's problem is not only physical. She, lose, she lost money and now the support of friends. And you know what? If you would go back to their culture, this woman, because of her condition, she is not allowed to go to the temple. She is not allowed to join public worship. For 12 long years, she cannot join the church. For 12 long years, she cannot see her pastor. For 12 long years, she cannot see her church mates. 
I know there are times that we don't feel like going to church, right? But I know you would agree with me that in times of problem, in times of troubles, one of the best places to go is the church. Amen? Because in the church, there is an atmosphere of peace. In the church, there is an atmosphere of, of faith. Somebody here in the church would pray for you. Somebody here in the church would, 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 would smile for you. Somebody here in the church would bless you by her, her or his music. One of the best places to go is the church when you have problems. Well, in fact, I know uh, from my exposure, there are people who would go to church because they have problems. But this woman, brothers and sisters, cannot go to church for 12 long years. She is not only in pain, but she is alone. She is in pain alone. So this woman had a terrible bleeding problem. She lost money. She lost her friends. And she cannot join the church for 12 years. Are you following the study so far? But the Bible tells us she came to Jesus. She came to Jesus and touched the border of the garment of Jesus. Verse 44. And that's the best thing to do if you have problems. You come to Jesus. Now, I know you have heard a lot of sermons about this woman. I know we were told that there is something in the border of the garment of a Jew. I know you have heard a lot of sermons about this woman, and we know, we are told, that in the, in the border of the garment of a Jew, in the border of the garment of Jesus, there is something there. There are tassels there, I believe in the next slide, there are tassels there that looks like this. It's called chitsit. In the fourth corner of the garment of a Jew, there are th these tassels, and this remind a Jew that of the commandments of Yahweh. This is a reminder for them about the commandments of Yahweh. And I believe this is the part of the garment of Jesus that the woman touched. This part of the garment that told her about the obedience of Jesus. This part of the garment that told her about the, good, the faithfulness of Jesus, about the righteousness of Jesus, and when her faith touch the righteousness of Jesus, instantly she was healed. When her faith touched the righteousness of Jesus, and I believe that is also the same with us, when my faith touched the righteousness of Jesus, healing and salvation comes. Amen? I used to believe that because I keep the Sabbath, I used to believe that because I do things others are not doing, that I don't do things others are not doing, that that's my assurance of salvation. But I'm glad I have learned that my hope is built on nothing less but on Jesus Christ and righteousness. Amen? My hope it's not on my good, do, good works and not, my and not in my obedience. I'm glad that the Bible is telling me and this church is teaching me that my hope of salvation is not on my righteousness, not on my good works, but on the righteousness of Jesus. Because the problem with my righteousness is as far as my righteousness is concerned, it is not acceptable because it's not qualified. The Bible testify, my righteousness is fallen short. It's not acceptable because it's not qualified. I can only modify the outward. I can modify what I, what, what I wear, what I say, what I do. 
But I cannot modify my heart. I cannot modify my very nature. I cannot modify my being, my sinful, proud, and selfish nature. I need a power that is above and beyond myself. And because I cannot, Jesus came to the picture. He became my substitute. He was treated as I am so that he, I can be treated as He is. Amen? The Seventh-day Adventist Church, our hope is built on nothing less but Jesus Christ and righteousness. We do good works not to be saved. We do good works as a fruit of our salvation. When the woman touched the border of the garment that told her about the righteousness of Jesus, she was healed instantly. For 12 years, she labored for healing, but in a moment of faith, she was healed. And I believe, if you are reading with me, Jesus asked the woman, uh, Jesus asked a question. Who touched me? Jesus said, who touched me? You see, I want to believe that the woman, the, the, the plan in her mind was, I'm going to touch the garment of Jesus, I'm going to be healed, then I am going to live. I will touch the garment of Jesus, I will be healed, then I am going to live. That's, that's, what, that's her plan. But Jesus wants to give her something that is more than she is looking for. We came here to study, but Jesus doesn't want us just to study. Jesus wants us to receive something that we are not more than we are looking for. Amen? Jesus wants a relationship. Jesus wants eternal life. Jesus wants to give us heaven, not only a degree, not only a title, but eternal life. Jesus wants to give the woman something that she is not looking for. And so Jesus asked, Who touched me? And Peter said, Lord, there are lots of people here, and how come you're asking who touched you? If I would paraphrase the, the statement of Peter, I would say, I, 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 this sounds, it sounds to me like this. Lord, you know, I did a little bit of evaluation with your question. And uh, it just seems to me that your question is invalid. It seems to be invalid, Lord. It, it doesn't make sense. There's a lot of people here, Lord, and you're asking who touched you. It doesn't make sense, Lord. But Peter doesn't know that Jesus is after something. Jesus is not asking because he wants to know something. Jesus was asking because he is facilitating something. She wants to give to the woman something. You know, even before the woman touched the garment of Jesus, Jesus already knew the woman. In the spirit of prophecy, we are told in the next slide, this, Jesus already knew her. Christ knew every thought of her mind, and he was making his way to where she stood. Jesus knew her before the touch. Jesus knew her, and Jesus did not only wait for her, but actually what Jesus did was she, he made an effort to get closer to the woman so that it will be easy for the woman to touch him. Jesus was not waiting for her. Jesus was getting closer to her. And so Jesus would, is not asking who touched me to know her? To know her she al he already know the woman. She wants to tell something to the woman. And then Jesus said, Somebody touch me. 
Jesus said, somebody touch me. Jesus said, somebody touch me. You know, I want to believe that for, that for the 12 long years that the woman was alone, for the 12 long years that the woman was in pain, for 12 long years that she was separated from his, her friends, from the church, something happened upon her. Something was changed on the way she looked upon herself. You see, when she approached Jesus, she could have asked Jesus verbally. She could have asked Jesus, Lord, can you heal me? She could have expressed her desire for healing verbally. But she opted in a silent touch of faith. And after that she was healed, she opted to leave the scene silently. She doesn't want any attention at all. As if she is accustomed to being alone. But Jesus knew her. To all her friends, she is nobody. To the people around her, she is nobody. To, her, to, to the doctor, she is nobody. To the church, she is nobody. But Jesus said, Somebody touch me. Did you get it? To others, she is nobody. To her friends, to the church, she is nobody. But to Jesus, Jesus wants to tell her, you're not nobody. You are somebody. If others are ignoring you, I am not. My attention is on you. I know you. In all these people who touch me, your touch is special. I know you. And you are the only person among these people who got my attention. That's why I ask, who touched me? Because I don't, not because I don't know you, but because I know you. And if somebody, is, if people are telling you that you are ignored, you are cast out, you are just a number, you are not. Because for me, you are special. I learned in this story that we should not allow others or circumstance to tell us who we are. Because the truth is, our value is in the heart of God. Amen? Let us not allow what we have or what we don't have to tell us who we are. Let us now allow failures or achievements to tell us who we are. Let us not allow what we don't have or what we have to tell us who we are before God. Because our value is at the heart of God. And you know what the truth is? I have come to learn that there's nothing that I can do to add or subtract to the value that God has put upon us. Amen? Your A grade will never add to your value even to an inch. Nor your F grade subtract to your value to an inch. Let, not, let us not allow the society to tell us our value because our value is at the very heart of God. You see, we as students, we tend to, we are tempted, they're, they're, sometimes we are tempted to think, oh, it's nice to be called a pastor, it's nice to be called a, a teacher, engineer, lawyer, doctor. But any title or any degree will never add to our value before God. Amen? Amen? Your value before you graduate and your value after you graduate is just the same before God. 
your value after you are done with your doctorate degree and the value of someone who is there begging in the streets are just the same. So I have come to realize that I study not to add a title or just to earn a degree. I have come to realize that my education is not for a title. My education is for better service. Amen? We are studying because we are preparing for a better service. We want an effective service. We want to reach more for Jesus. And that's it. Titles will never add to your value. My value is at the heart of God. Regardless of how many subjects you return to, regardless of how many Latin awards you're going to have after you graduate, your value is just the same. My value is found at the cross of Calvary. Amen? At the cross, we can see our true value before God. Because at the cross is the opening of the heart of God. At the cross, you will see the heart of God. The cross is not about the blood. It's not about the thorns. You will not see the blood. You will not see the thorns at the cross. At the cross, you will see the heart of God open up. And you will see there your own place at the heart of God. What held Jesus at the cross? Was it the nails? Was it the nails that nailed Jesus at the cross? No, not the nails. The nails are powerless. Not the nails. Jesus stayed at the cross because there's something much more powerful holding him there. He could have asked, he could have removed himself there. He could have asked the Father, this is enough. He could have... Uh, commanded the angels, get me out of here. But he stayed. He stayed because of one, one strong power. And that is the power of his love. Amen? He stayed on the cross because he cannot let us go. He stayed at the cross because his creation is precious before him. He stayed at the cross because he, he, had, he had chosen himself to die rather than us. The cross is a clear revelation of who we are before God. And you see, Jesus called the woman in verse 48, last verse. We will go forward to the last verse, verse 48. Jesus said to the woman, Daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you go, go in peace. Jesus said, You are a daughter. All this time she is alone. All this time she thought she is nobody. All this time she is being ignored by, by, by the society that she is living. Her friends left her. The church is not there for her. She is alone. She doesn't have a friend, but Jesus told her, you're not alone. You're not nobody. You're somebody. In fact, you are a daughter. Amen? And you know what? If you would study the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, one commentary told us, That in the whole Gospels, in the whole Gospels, there is only one woman that Jesus personally called daughter. In the book of Matthew, Mark, John, and Luke, there is only one woman that Jesus called daughter. And this is she. This woman. Jesus wants to tell her that your experience 
your failures, what you've lost in the society that around you, they have no say with what, who you are. Because in my eyes, you are my daughter. Amen? So the woman was not only healed, she was not only restored to the society that she belongs. Now she can go to the church again because she has already healed, but Jesus gave him her more. Jesus told her that God loves her, that she is a daughter. So in the midst of us, in this university, may it be that our value will be placed in the right foundation. You are good at getting good grades. Yes, we, has, we, we have to start to do our best. We have to get good grades. But the grades will not add to your value. Yes, we have to, to study well. But our performance will not, will not add to your value. Nor your failure. Nor how many long years you will study here. Some would graduate seven years. Some eight years. In my case, 20 years. But that will not subtract or add to my value. Because this evening, the clear message is, your value and my value is in the heart of Jesus. Amen? May the Lord bless us this evening. Take my life and let it be. Let us all rise. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us this evening 
that our value does not depend on what we have or what we don't have, on what we can or we cannot do. But our value is at the heart of Jesus. Our failures, our achievements, does not add or subtract to our value. May it be the foundation, Lord, of our self-worth, that we will do our best not to add value to ourselves, but because we have known that you have loved us so much. In the love of Jesus, be the center of our lives. We will do our best not to add value to ourselves, but because Jesus has loved us so much. Thank you, Lord, for this evening. May your blessings be with us, with us as we depart. And the Holy Spirit will continue to inspire our hearts with the love of Jesus. Thank you for saving us, for loving us. And if you, thank you for your mercy that is always following our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.